friends, and welcome to this week's episode. I have Dr. Leah Antonevich with me again. Um, as you know, Leah is one of my fantastic partners and has a wealth of knowledge, but not only, and but especially in the field of nutrition. So we're going to talk today a little bit about this belly fat and insulin resistance thing, because I know it's so frustrating for so many of you. Wouldn't you say, I think it's one of the most common questions that we get. Welcome. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me back. Uh, yes, it is one of our top complaints that women coming in saying, I'm doing the same thing or I'm doing more and right. I'm still getting this belly fat or I'm feeling softer. The number on this scale is going up. Yeah. So we believe you. It really is true. Um, part of it's lifestyle and part of it is hormonal so we want to talk about both of those aspects because it is a really annoying thing that happens in midlife and not only is it annoying like why do we care about insulin resistance and fat gain around the middle i mean what's the big deal about it really so we know that increased visceral fat and insulin resistance are absolutely connected to all-cause mortality. Mm -hmm. So as those things go up, inflammation goes up, they're hand in hand. It's kind of a cyclical cascade. Yeah. And we know that um, all diseases, cancer, heart disease, all of it um, increases and you can die prematurely of these things. Right. Of course, we think about type 2 diabetes related to insulin resistance, but you're absolutely right. I mean, heart disease, cancers, even dementia and all kinds of things. And just dying early. So it is really important, not just looking good in our swimsuit, but having uh, the healthy long life that we want to. So let's delve into how we can address that, not just to look good, but also to live longer, right? So when, when I was growing up, and until quite recently, we were taught that you eat fewer calories, you lose weight, right? The calorie model or the so-called Weight Watchers model, just eat less, lose weight. That's not working for us anymore. Like what, what are we missing there with the calorie counting method? Well, um, a couple of things with calorie counting because not all calories are the same, mm -hmm. number one. So we know that we are very, very, very good at metabolizing carbohydrates 100%. Um, whereas something like protein, we don't mm -hmm. metabolize all of it. In fact, we utilize a lot of energy to metabolize right. it. So yeah. probably about 80% of a gram compared to 100% of a gram of carbohydrate. Um, also, uh, fiber. So fiber, although it's a carbohydrate, is going to be processed differently and it's going to have many beneficial effects and not spike insulin. So if I go and have white rice compared to having a sweet potato, uh, same amount of calories, the effects on my body and the hormonal effects on my body are going to be completely different, even including my sleep that night. Yeah. So it's really time to abandon counting calories, mm -hmm. I think. And so... That, that model doesn't work. It doesn't work, certainly as we're getting older. Uh, not that calorie restriction won't cause us to lose weight, but it's n not the end of the story by any means. So, so much more to it. So you mentioned about you know, carbohydrates and protein. So let's just talk about insulin. Where does it come from? What's its function in our body? Uh, we know there's juvenile diabetics and type 2 diabetics. Kind of what's the basic story yeah. about that. Sure. So um, insulin is one of our many hormones in our body. It's secreted by our pancreas and it has, we'll just simplify this and say it has two main jobs. One is to um, put glucose into our cells or even store that glucose a little bit as glycogen, not important, but that's the way it's stored. Also, once the glycogen storages are full, it actually gets stored as fat for us to use later on. Yeah, which would make great sense, mm -hmm. right? And uh, our biological... Um, ancestral days, we would have periods of time where we didn't have food. So in times of excess, it would make a lot of sense to store it as fat. And then during the day, even during the hours that we're not eating, we need that glycogen in our muscles so mm -hmm. that we can run fast if we haven't eaten for four hours. So all of this makes sense when our metabolism is working well. But what can go wonky with that picture? And what's causing this new thing where we get the belly fat. So a couple of things can happen, you know, specifically in midlife, something women experience is uh, hormone deficiency. So estrogen is very important for the liver to function to grab that sugar out and testosterone plays a role as well. And so just by a fluctuation of just those hormones, we can become insulin resistant because mm -hmm. those receptors aren't being expressed in um, the way that we process glucose is has changed. 
When that happens and the sugar is sitting in our bloodstream, the body thinks, hmm, well, I'm gonna go ahead and save this for Dr. Susan later when she's trekking three days to go find <laughs> buffalo or right. running from the saber-toothed tiger. And so our body's super smart that way. Well, in our modern society, we never go three days without food and we don't run from wild animals, most of us anyway. And so we keep packing on that fat and our hormones decrease. And there's other things that are affecting us in our modern day life, like cortisol. Mm -hmm. Cortisol has a huge role to play on insulin. Um, and over time, as we're chronically stressed, it keeps playing that role and we get fatter and fatter and fatter. So for example, similar analogy, cortisol is another hormone and it's very important for fight or flight. Well, if we're chronically stressed, the body's constantly making sugar available to us to go run and to flee or to fight whatever we need to fight. And so that also ends up making us pack on weight and it decreases our metabolism and our immune system among other things. Yeah, all the, it's amazing, isn't it, that our lifestyle is really lending towards this um, fat storing model. Mm. Uh, you touched on cortisol, also affected by sleep deprivation, which I talk about a lot because it was so, and Dr. Leah struggles with this too, you know, for perimenopause and menopause, mm. it's, it can be really difficult to sleep. That's a huge factor. And then just the prevalence of uh, high carbohydrate, easy to reach for foods and, and our environment. So this seems like, it seems like one thing after another stacking up against us almost, isn't it? Absolutely. But we can be successful, right? So you're going to tell us some ways that we can help this, what feels like a fire burning out of control sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, some very simple, obvious things are, you know, our activity. We all get tired of hearing that we have to move our body, but when we are exercising, even if we're using our muscles a little bit more than normal, we actually open up these channels for the sugar to just dive right in. They don't even need insulin. So just moving is an excellent way for us to fight insulin resistance and bring our glucose levels back to normal. Um, we basically alluded to the fact that we need to get good sleep. Mm -hmm. We really have to sleep like it's our job. Mm -hmm. uh, not only do we repair our bodies during that time, but we also are able to decrease our cortisol and so many other things that will come into play. If we are chronically stressed and our cortisol is chronically high, then we are going to stay insulin resistant and it's actually going to get worse. Yeah. And it, it can get a bit overwhelming, can it? Because this is, it, it is very complex. I mean, mm -hmm. hormonal science is very complicated and we are learning more about it all the time. Uh, but it, we can simplify it, I think. And, and you do such a good job with this just to break it down to like, what are the most important things? So mm -hmm. what I'm hearing is over time, we're producing more insulin than we need. Our mm -hmm. body's not sensitive to it. So we're storing sugar as fat. How do we turn that around? Like what, what are some simple things that any person could implement without really disrupting their life? And you can eat. How about yes. that? You can eat quite a bit. So high protein, high fiber. How simple is that? Yeah. I mean, just start there. And um, if it doesn't have fiber in it and it's a carbohydrate, just don't eat it. There's plenty that are, and you will feel full and you will feel good. But the protein recommendations we've talked about as well. And then, you know, we could say, let's just talk about the rule of 30s. Mm -hmm. So we want 30 grams of protein at a meal. We want 30 grams of fiber in the day. And we don't want more than 30 grams of carbohydrate at a time. And that's pretty simple, right? Yeah. And so I think that's very simple. So if you can break it down to something you can actually implement. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, if I focus on eating enough protein during the day, that by itself solves a lot of other potential issues because eating 30 grams of protein four times a day. So for me, I'm trying to get 120 grams. We've talked before about one gram per ideal body weight, one gram of protein per ideal body weight in pounds. So maybe that's around 120 pounds. Different than your goal weight, much be, might be much higher than that, mm -hmm. but what your ideal body weight is on a BMI chart. So if I'm eating 120 grams of protein, I'm pretty full. Pretty full. Yeah. And then the fiber element, of course, makes us full as well. 30 grams of fiber. I, we've talked here about fiber before. That is hard to get. Now you're speaking to someone who's had a plant-based diet much of my life. Mm -hmm. A serving of vegetables may be two to three grams of fiber. So it it's really takes some intentionality or fiber supplement, which I, I do. Me too. Yeah. I love my fiber supplement. So. Yeah. So what's it, what's good about fiber and how does it interact with sugar and insulin? 
Fiber does so many things for your body, but specifically regarding that, it slows down the absorption of sugar. Um, it also feeds the good bacteria in your intestinal tract, which increases your metabolism. It also makes your intestinal tract more efficient. And so it, in its own way, increases its energy and metabolism. It also decreases cancers and makes you feel full. So, yeah, so many good things. And it's so easy to do. I've talked about the product I like. There's so many out there. I take a scoop of this product uh, by happens to be by Thorne. You know, I love them. It's, it's made with sun fiber. Mm -hmm. So you mix it with water and it's not gritty. And it's about eight grams of fiber, which might not sound like a whole lot, but that's a big chunk of my daily requirements and then several servings of vegetables. So it takes a bit of time to get there, but talking back to easy things, protein, fiber, and water. That's how sort of three-part nutrition plan. Right? Absolutely. So water, <laughs> being just, fill us up, right? absolutely. water not only fills us up, but when we're dehydrated, it actually triggers a hormone in our brain to tell us that we're hungry. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we just need to drink. It also increases your blood sugar when yeah. you're dehydrated as well. So being hydrated is really, really good. As you know, you don't necessarily have to carry around one of those jugs that I see people mm -hmm. carrying around all the time, but you know, eight glasses or whatever it is, is a, a pretty good goal. Yeah, I've heard so many different recommendations for water. Just stay hydrated. I think a really simple way is to make sure your urine is a very clear color, mm -hmm. not dark yellow. Uh, some people say uh, one ounce per half of your body weight, so 60 ounces a day for me, for example, yeah. many ways to think about it. I just try to drink water regularly throughout the day. Yeah, I, I like the the urine test uh -huh. personally. I think yeah. if it's light yellow to clear, I know I'm hydrated. I yeah, mean, that's really simple. I would, we can overcomplicate things mm -hmm. and it's very easy to go down a rabbit hole with any of this stuff, right? Uh, where we're count, for me, if I'm counting all day, I'm obsessed with food. And for me, being able to remove food from something I'm thinking about all day is really important. So simple. Absolutely. And that's a stress in itself, right? Because mm -hmm. it's taking more effort. And that's why people give up. Like, I can't do this. I can't that's do right. this. I can't do this. So find the simplest things that you can that, that work for you. And we'll do those, you know, uh, like you like said on your last video, people get so granular and they're down to the like point Oh, one gram of this, yeah. that, or the other. That's not important. You know, the big yeah. things, the sleeping, the moving your body, high fiber, high protein. You know, if you do that in the water, then you're way ahead of the game. That's right. So try that first. Now, if someone came and saw you or mm -hmm. saw me and said, look, I'm doing all this. I'm eating my 120 gram. I'm doing all those things. Or even if you wanted to do it before then, we can do some diving into measuring your insulin, measuring your sugar. So let's mm -hmm. talk about that. And you, you, you can ask your doctor to do it, but you can also do it yourself, right? And then just talk about what our goal values are for those particular labs, because the lab has some pretty extraordinary ranges. Yes, the lab does have some extraordinary ranges. You know, they, they take, you know, let's just say a thousand people off the street and they could be literally on death's door or they could be in optimal health. Well, we use different ranges. We use optimal health ranges because we want you to be a blossoming flower, not a wilted plant. That's right. You've but, always, we want you to have an A plus, not a C minus. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, well, let's start with fasting glucose. Most of y'all have that. Most of y'all know about that. So a hundred or less than 95, that would be really fantastic. That's uh, something though that if I don't eat long enough, I'm, I'm gonna be able to hit that number. So that's why we also look at two other values, including our fasting insulin, which ideally we would really like to be less than five. And I believe the reported reference ranges go anywhere from, from two, two to 25. <laughs> yeah. They're really wide. Yeah, if you have a, so if you get your labs done and it says it's falling in the normal column, actually look at that number because you can have a fasting insulin of 24 and it would still be read as normal and you would be very very metabolically ill mm -hmm. in that case so we want to look at the actual number yeah. so really as low as possible yeah but even even less than eight is real, mm -hmm. real, very That's good great. very yeah. good um, but then we also can move to another lab which y'all are familiar with probably called the hemoglobin a1c and that is taking a look at red cells that have kind of sugar on them we'll oversimplify that but it's a three-month calculation average of what we think the glucose is by looking at how uh, many uh, molecules of glucose or how glycosylated the red blood cells are. And again, that's a range issue. Um, a lot of people are told, oh, if you're 5.7 or higher, you're a pre-diabetic. Well, no, 
there's no such thing as pre-diabetes. That just means that you aren't yet being given a medication. It means that you're already insulin resistant. And as a matter of fact, at 5.5 or higher, there's a linear relationship with each tenth of a point that you increase your risk of all cause mortality. That means cancer, dementia, heart attack, everything. Yeah, so we don't want to wait till you get sick again. If we're seeing that trend up, and I talked about this last week, even if it went from 5 to 5.1 to 5.2, that's still going to be well within the normal range, mm -hmm. but it is suggesting that something's changing that we could intervene with early. And you're probably noticing on as the human being in that equation that you're getting fat around the middle. So mm -hmm. in a certain respect, you know, we want to listen to you and what your symptoms mm -hmm. are. Now I have patients, I'm sure you do too, who their lives look great. They might have a fasting insulin that's seven and a fasting glucose of 85 and their hemoglobin A1C is normal, they're still struggling with this. And in fact, they are insulin resistant. We're just not picking it up on that fasting panel. So there are some other ways if you feel like that's happening, like, oh my gosh, they said I'm fine. Dig a little deeper because sometimes our sugar goes up later in the day. Mm -hmm. We might have spikes going on that are not being picked up on that test. Our average sugar could even be normal, but average of 100, it could be ranging from 40 to 180. Mm -hmm. So digging into that a little bit more, what are some suggestions for that? Well, that's a person that I would absolutely recommend a continuous glucose monitor. Yeah. Um, and I, I do, we do see patients like that. So we know that we're just not catching with those tests what's really going on and we know that they're insulin resistant. Right, yeah, so, sometimes that's so true. And if you feel like this, and I, I have so many patients who do that are being told, you're fine, your labs look great, it must just be in your head or you're secretly eating in the closet. If, I've had patients tell me this, oh, terrible. No, you know when you're not fine. You know when something's changed. And you're always right. We just haven't found it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So dig a little deeper. CGM is a great idea. You don't need to be diabetic to have a continuous glucose monitor. Anyone can get one. I mean, insurance might not cover it, but it's an investment that uh, you and I have worn ourselves. Absolutely. I think it's very useful. And surprising sometimes um, how our sugar can change with fruits that one might not think. And then other ways that we can intervene if it is spiking high. Mm -hmm. So for example, what's an example you can think of? If you eat a certain thing, your sugar goes up and what's an intervention that could change that? So for, in my personal experimentation, I um, absolutely love ice cream so much. Yeah. So I actually ran the experiment. So I ate the ice cream and with one kind, my sugar actually got up to 180. I couldn't believe it. Actually, it wasn't ice cream. It was straight up cookies with no fat. But yeah. um, then I did the same thing and I had um, fiber and protein before it and it only went up to 140. And now it did stay, it did take a long time for it to come down, but the point is that it didn't spike. Um, and that just goes to show you how fiber and protein and the changes that they make in our intestinal system and changes that they make on the hormones on the brain can allow us to kind of hack things. Now, I'm not saying go around and eat a salad and then ice cream. That's not what I'm saying, but yeah. have fiber and protein before you have your carbohydrate, for right. example. I mean, sometimes we are going to want to enjoy mm -hmm. something that's off our, uh, personal rules for what we know we should eat. And those are really great interventions. And then uh, you'd mentioned something really interesting too about how sugar is stored in our liver and muscles in the form of glycogen. Mm -hmm. Another way to, to drop your sugar is use your muscles, right? Exercise. I've seen that myself. It makes a dramatic difference. You go for a walk and it's dropped. Absolutely. So, um, a you can, if you have a continuous glucose monitor on, you can actually walk around for a couple of minutes or even just do some jumping jacks or some body squats and things like that. And you will just see it go down. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you can do if you're kind of struggling with, well, gosh, after I eat, my sugars are really going up. You can titrate the amount of carbohydrate and you can also move your body until it goes down to 140 or 120, preferably, or something like that. So these are all little things that you can do and measure, well, what do I need to do in my own body? You know, can I eat regular potatoes or can I not eat regular potatoes? Does it have to always be with the peel or without the peel? And you can figure all of those things out. Well, this fruit does this to me and this fruit, I was totally even keel. So important. Really 
important point I think you made is that there's not a nutrition plan that works for every person the mm -hmm. same way. Because it is really interesting with this type of technique where you can see what works for you. And I've found that in my own body. So if you are interested in ordering a continuous glucose monitor, you do need a doctor to prescribe it for you. I would simply ask your doctor to do that. Um, quite easy to do and certainly not covered by insurance, but it might be an investment that will help you if you're struggling and wondering why is this happened? I, I don't know what else to do. That can often unlock some answers. So what I'm hearing is protein, fiber, water, sleep, movement. I mean, could we do five things? It sounds like a lot of things. And I talked about 10 things last week. It seems like a lot of things, but these are these are doable, not mm. too difficult, no. I, I think. They're not too difficult. And again, if you're just... If you're not overthinking it and you even start focusing on one thing for the month mm -hmm. and then that becomes a habit, yeah. then you don't have to think about it anymore. And then you can build on these other things. That's the, another reason I think people get frustrated and stop is they try to change too many things. Yeah. They make it too complicated and the brain literally rejects it because it feels like too much work. It's not not memory for them. It's not natural for them. So don't overdo it. Think yeah. about easing into just one thing at a time. Some things that I've done, and you might find something similar in order to get the supplements that I need, putting them in a memorable place. I just thought of an example. My fiber is, I like my coffee every morning. Right by my coffee pot is my little thing with my fiber. So every morning I'm reminded, oh, I do my scoop of fiber with my probiotic and then I have my cup of coffee. Whatever works for you to make it easy. So I've done that a thousand times now so I do it every day and actually now I'm at a point where if for some reason my fiber wasn't there or if I'm traveling I'm like oh I thought something was missing exactly <laughs> so these are such simple habits um, if you're consistent you mm -hmm. do it over and over and like any habit do it over and over it becomes ingrained similar with the protein habit just I love what you said about the 30 grams and just, I'd love for you to repeat that because it's such a good thing to remember. Uh, sure. The rule of thirties. Yeah. Um, so 30 grams of protein in a meal, not more than 30 grams of carbohydrate and you want 30 grams of fiber in the day. Yeah. So looking, I've, I've gotten in the habit of doing this, which is quite fantastic because of your advice. Thank you. <laughs> I'll look at the, whatever it is that I'm about to eat and that will just occur to me. Okay. Does this have 30 grams of protein? Um, does it have more than 30 grams of carbs? Maybe I can switch a it a little bit in order for it to meet that. Or mm -hmm. maybe there are times that no, it doesn't. And I'm going to mindfully just eat something that I know isn't perfect, but I'm not doing it without being aware that that's what I'm doing. Exactly. In progress, not perfection. That's right. Progress, not perfection. So that's don't, right. don't get all tied up. Some other, some other little helpful hacks too, that, um, you know, I do, a lot of people do drinking a little apple cider vinegar before a meal and or after a meal, which also can help with heartburn. Um, you know, there's a supplement that um, we've talked a lot about berberine, which mm -hmm. can help stabilize blood sugar, cinnamon, uh, turmeric, you know, there's other things. I'm not saying go, go and, and um, start taking all of these things and don't make any changes. I'm not saying that at all, but these are tools that can help us, especially when we're trying to find that new normal to get those blood sugars down and get our insulin down more importantly. So if you came into our office and we measured your insulin and, and we see this all the time um, and it's a bit high. So for example, over eight, as we were suggesting, mm -hmm. and your sugar's a little high, you're not diabetic, but you're struggling with fat around the middle and you're starting to walk down that path towards type two diabetes. It's remarkable how quickly that can change. And, and tell us what you see in your patients. Like, so they, they start these interventions, they're following the rule of thirties and doing their movement, they're sleeping better, watching their stress. It truly can change in you know several weeks and a couple of months, right? I mean, very quick results. For sure. I mean, a lot of times I see people back at about the six week mark mm -hmm. and I definitely, their body comp has changed by doing mm -hmm. those five simple things, yeah. you know, the sleep, the protein, the fiber, the water, and the, uh, changing the carbohydrate. Again, just making it a complex carbohydrate. So uh, it's really that fast. It's that fast. And you didn't get this way. You know, it took you two decades maybe to get in this state. So give it more than two days to work. <laughs> but it does, it does work. Anything where you lose weight rapidly is very likely not going to result in long-term success. So we're really interested in getting mm -hmm. you to your healthiest body composition and staying there forever. So 
let's talk about that a little bit because a lot of uh, very nutritionally restricted or calorie restricted weight loss plans are going to result in weight loss. Mm -hmm. And we see this a lot actually with um, some of these weight loss drugs that we do love, mm -hmm. the GLP-1 agonists in particular in the community where people are just not eating at all. Right. And so what can happen that goes wonky in that situation that causes us to gain it back? Well, a, a couple of things. So A, um, you're slowing down your metabolism. So your body's very, very smart. And it says, oh my goodness, you know, there's no food around. So I'm going to slowly his metabolism down. So there's that. And then there is the fact that you are depriving yourself of precious nutrients that you need. So I have seen people go into the hospital for all kinds of things. I've seen them have um, neurologic difficulties because they're so mm -hmm. deficient. I've seen them um, have to go in the hospital for uh, problems with their kidneys. I've had all kinds of things. And you need nutrition. You need to eat. Especially protein, as <laughs> yes. we talked about. So starving yes. ourselves of protein. Absolutely. And protein has so many nutrients in it. Eggs have nutrients, all of that. And then thirdly, we found out that in more recent studies, that it, actually the yo-yo dieting, even just the five pounds up and down, probably has more long-term um, health detriment mm -hmm. than if you had just stayed whatever weight that it was because of the metabolic changes that are going on and the stresses in your body and the inflammation that that can cause. So anything that's done rapidly, not to mention the muscle loss as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're losing weight rapidly. So there is a way to do things in it and nothing, almost nothing is going to be, you know, a quick fix. Yeah. Slow and steady, but it's remarkably fast when I say slow and steady. So, um, we frequently see patients in a healthy manner, losing up to 10 pounds of fat a month without losing mm -hmm. muscle. Now that would be someone who has quite a bit of weight to lose, but you can imagine, you know, I always think time's going to pass either way. It's going to be a year from now soon enough. So where am I going to be a year from now? Mm -hmm. You know, so just thinking of it as a long-term plan and then just let those habits settle in. And it just sort of takes care of itself. I think rather than, like you said, being so, I've done it obsessed on details, uh, yeah. right? So make it simple and it'll stick. I think that's great advice. So we talked about muscle. So muscle's really interesting in this whole insulin resistant mm -hmm. picture, isn't it? Because not only do we store glycogen in our muscles, but having more muscle mass independently is beneficial for weight loss mm -hmm. on so many levels, right? So let's talk about the importance of muscle again. I know you're tired of me talking about it, but it's so important. Well, it bears repeating mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I had a patient the other day that just did not want to increase her protein intake and, and I just started explaining so many things. So if I sit here and I have more muscle mass, I'm going to burn more calories just sitting here doing mm -hmm. nothing. Um, not to mention if I have more muscle, I'm also just going to extract glucose from my bloodstream and I'm not going to turn it into fat, which is going to turn into inflammation, which is going to turn into all kinds of metabolic diseases and not, uh, disorders. I also, as a woman, uh, well, even as a man, but as a woman, am I going to protect my bones? I'm going to mm -hmm. be strong. I'm not going to fall. If I do fall, I'm going to have a cushion. I'm not going to have a fracture. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also, if I have more muscle mass, going to have more energy throughout the day. When I walk up the stairs, I'm not going to be winded. When I mm -hmm. take those groceries home, I'm going to just, you know, walk with them freely and not be... Yeah, out of breath. So it, it impacts our complete and total lives, all aspects. That really does. And that reminds me of something, personal story. In my skinny fat days, which happened at, in perimenopause, I was very, I did a lot of aerobic activity, but didn't do any strength training. And my body fat got up higher than it should be. And my muscle mass was quite low. I remember carrying the Christmas ornaments up to the attic, mm -hmm. which is an activity many of us do annually. And just thinking, I can't even pick up this box. I'm just feeling weak, which for me, and you might resonate with this, it corresponded with a feeling of mental weakness. Like, help me, I can't, I need, like, I can't do it by myself rather than I got this, I can do it. So I think there's so many factors, but the physical strength correlating with just sort of mental wellness too is something that often is not talked about. It's all of the things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just nothing no downside to having more muscle mass. You have to exercise to get it, which is good in the meantime. And then once you've got it, it helps you to be healthier. Mm -hmm. So it's a fantastic virtuous cycle. Yeah. And having that muscle mass, you're going to burn that cortisol. I mean, it right. just, it's, it's the opposite it's of the bad better. cascade. It's That's the good right. cascade. So. so we all know how to get muscle. We just have to do the work and it is a commitment 
to your future. And you alluded to this, but if we have insulin resistance, the, the treatment is quite well written. You just have mm -hmm. to follow it. And it's mm -hmm. those things, right? Just what I heard you say, protein, fiber, water, Sleep, movement, movement, muscle mass, sleep, the things that we know are good for us. Yeah. And I think um, we were talking about this earlier today. For sometimes, and I've been one of these people too, no judgment. Sometimes we have patients who just are like, I don't want that. What's the magic? I need the, what's the pill for this? <laughs> like, what's the magic button? There isn't one really. And if someone tells you that there is, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's a, it's a lifestyle change. And it's one that I can tell you, it really does feel good. It feels good to be strong. It does. I, I get the same thing. Yeah. If I feel weak, I get depressed. And right. I mean, you know, I was like, my gosh, what am I going to be like in 20 years? Right. Like, it feels, you know, it feels so. very, I felt very old, like, oh my, this is going in a direction. Just nothing good. A very negative emotional state, mm -hmm. I think. And then we all know exercise helps us to feel better because of the endorphins. We all know, too, we feel terrible when our sugar is too high or too low. Absolutely. Like I said, it's a nice feeling to have stable sugar throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, the brain fog that goes with that sugar low, too. Yeah, so, I mean, I eat a low-carb lunch, and um, that way I can continue to function. Y'all all know what food coma is. Yeah. And, you know, when your brain's not functioning and you're already feeling maybe not great, and then you're like, oh, one more thing, I'm broken, I'm broken, I'm broken. Yeah. It's oh, just you, this you vicious cycle. you know what cycle. I want to do when I feel like that? Yeah. Eat a candy bar. For sure. Yeah. And or that's why your, your brain's literally telling yeah. you to do that, too. Your brain's like, I'm, I'm low on sugar. Need we need sugar. to, yeah, go yeah. get the donut. Yeah. Yeah. And these cravings are very real. So um, it happens. And I felt that way, too. So not negating that it's it's simple, but not easy, which lends into uh, this is, I think, a really important part of any program that's addressing weight management or habit change is, is the mind state part. Mm. And so that's a big part of our weight loss program. And I know that's something you're really passionate about. We can say all day, do these things. But it's very difficult to implement mm -hmm. if our mind is derailing us. So what are some, this is very important. I mean, in any type of program where we're trying to change anything, it, it comes from our mind. Yeah. So what's your motivation? Mm -hmm. And your motivation cannot be, oh, it's my high school reunion. I want to be back in my skinny jeans. It, that is a very, very limited motivation in a time that's going to pass. And then you're going to be high school reunions over, or I didn't make my goal. And you might even gain weight. So how is it? How about I want to feel like this. I want to be able to be on the floor with my grandchildren. I want to be the whippersnapper that's driving all my friends around when I'm 85. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll all have autonomous vehicles at that point, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you need a motivation that is long term and that truly speaks to you. So there's that. So why are you doing this? And then you need to think about the things and the roadblocks that you have faced and will continue to face and how to hedge against those. Um, a daily morning practice, spiritual practice in general, but surrounding your goals, whatever they are, is very, very important. About the first half hour that you're awake, your brain is still in has theta waves and is very receptive to things. So literally telling yourself things out loud, writing things down. I have uh, statements written in Sharpie and on my mirrors all over my house mm -hmm. and they change and, but they do work and I do say them out loud. I also practice something called thought stopping. Um, as soon as that negative voice comes into my head and I assure you that it does, I exchange that and I say, either I literally out loud say stop or in my mind, I say no. And I reverse that and I say the opposite because I have done X or because I know this to be true in my mm -hmm. past. Uh, one other thing for changing a behavior, whether it's eating or decreasing um, alcohol or decreasing screen time is to use an acronym called HALT. And that's hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Those are all triggers for us to eat or consume, whether that's consume um, television or mm -hmm. consume alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. And you can um, look at those things and be mindful and be like, okay, I am truly hungry. I'm going to eat real food first. Mm -hmm. And then if I still want X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to mindfully take a portion of that cake or whatever it is. But um, being angry, it could be any kind of extreme emotion, usually anger. Lonely um, also could be bored. 
you're looking mm-hmm. for something yeah. to do. And then tired, of course, is tired. So you can try to take a nap, do a two minute breathing exercise that empowers your um, brain, or you can actually, you know, go to bed early and practice sleep hygiene, all of the above. Which is such a beautiful idea. And it all it sounds like it's all just different forms of being aware mm-hmm. of what's going on in our mind. Because I've certainly had this experience, and I'm sure you have too, listening, of eating mindlessly, or eating while I'm doing something else and not paying attention to what I'm eating, not even enjoying what I'm eating. Um, so not noticing even, did I, wow, did I just eat a bag of chips? I didn't notice. Yeah. So just... Uh, Television and devices <sighs> off when you're eating. Right. Yeah. Really good ideas. So... Just as a review, I think you did a beautiful job talking about what insulin resistance is. Mm -hmm. This hormone gets too high. It tricks our body into storing more sugar and turning that into fat for the Arctic winter that's not coming anytime (laughs) soon. And we need to turn that around Mm -hmm. so our body thinks it's okay to burn fat, right? Because I I think our body's so smart and we're so incredibly intelligent. Mm -hmm. It's really trying to help us, but our body sort of forgot that we're not cavemen living in a state of potential starvation or not going to be chased by a tiger. Uh, so just chronic stress is tricking us into thinking something's going on. So yeah, I want to, I don't know, nurture with compassion this body that's so intelligent and trying to help us mm-hmm. by feeding her really healthy food. And, you know, just going back to what we've talked about before, this whole idea that we really are what we eat, you know, and treating your body as a temple and all these things that we know. Yeah, treat her kindly. Feed her some good, delicious, nutritious food. Not that crappy bunch of chemicals on the back of the box. Mm -hmm. Um, And she'll respond well to compassion, just like every living being would. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just so glad to have you here. And I I think your message is so positive because it can lead to despair. I was there. It's like, why is this happening to me? How can I be gaining fat around the middle when I'm literally running marathons. And I know many of you resonate with that. I can tell you in my case, I wasn't eating enough protein. I was over-exercising, not sleeping enough, living a very high-stress life, eating lots of sugar. You know, it happens and there's nothing wrong with you. But we can address it so you can live a longer, healthier life. Absolutely. Any final words that... um, you think are helpful because I know you have such an, we could talk for hours about this. <laughs> we really could. Well, um, just nurture yourself, be kind mm-hmm. to yourself, be mentally and physically kind to yourself, treat yourself like you would your very best friend mm-hmm. or a sister that you love or someone like that. So yeah, really good advice. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to highlight some of these things. And if you would like to see Leah in the office, uh, you know how to reach us at Complete Midlife Wellness Center.com. Um, Leah has different visits. You would visit with a patient for hormone consultation, nutritional consultation, to be part of our weight loss program, any of the above, whatever we can do to help. We can assess your CGM data if you mm-hmm. have that, all of these things, because it, it sometimes we just need a partner and a friend on this journey. Doing it by yourself is hard. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're, we're here to help you to be successful, and you can be. I'm an example. She is too. Our patients are living proof that this actually works and it's really not that hard. And then you feel great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, and I can't wait to see you next week. 